paz. Amen. That's Bono Bennett, by the way. <laughs> Thanks, Michael. Um, Father, we ask that you would help us now to preach, to proclaim what is true, and not be stuck in a moment in this world of passing time, but to live in the reality of your eternal love. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, when I was 19, Grandpa took me on a roller coaster. Oh? <laughs> up, down, up, down. Oh, what a ride. What a great story. I always wanted to go again. You know, it was just interesting to me that a ride could make me so, so frightened, so scared, so sick, so, so excited and, and so thrilled all together. Some didn't like it. They went on the merry-go-round. That just goes around. Nothing. I like the roller coaster. You get more out of it. <laughs> That's Steve Martin in the movie uh, Parenthood. He's stressed about life when Grandma walks in and tells a story about her dad and a roller coaster. Up, down, up, down. Oh, what a ride. After the sermon last week, a couple people sent me that clip. It's actually one of my favorite clips, and so I thought, yeah, I'll show it to remind us of our message last week and start our message this week. Last week, we said that life is like a runaway train, and you just feel out of control. But a roller coaster is also like a runaway train. But on a roller coaster, even though you have no control, someone else is in control. And if you trust that that someone is in control, doesn't hate you, well, you can throw your hands in the air and scream, what a ride, even while you're on the ride. Last week, we ended by saying you're not on a roller coaster, or you're not on a runaway train. You, you, you are on a roller coaster. Runaway train is kind of a roller coaster. You're on a roller coaster, strapped in right next to the Prince of Peace. You're on a roller coaster with the Prince of Peace. According to Paul, he's telling you his story, history. And you are actually experiencing his life. So his story becomes your story. You are on the Jesus Christ adventure ride and is producing something. Grandma said some, some didn't like it. They went on the merry-go-round. That just goes around. Nothing. I like the roller coaster. You get more out of it. Yeah, you get faith. Your life is to be a glorious adventure full of twists and turns, mountains and valleys, even pain and suffering that ends in glory as you scream to your Father in heaven, what a ride, what a ride. But in fear, we try to turn life into a merry-go-round. At least in our own heads. We shut our eyes, we grab the safety bar, and desperately try to seize control. We stop living. In other words, we try to save our lives and lose them. If you save your life, you're not living your life. You're riding the merry-go-round. You know what I mean. It's 2.30 in the morning. And a thought enters your head. 
and you just start going round and round in, in your head. You get nowhere, and, and you just can't stop. It's a, like a merry-go-round of anxiety. Or you're at a party, and someone makes a comment, and you start going round and round in, in your head. You're getting nowhere, and you can't stop thinking about yourself. And so you can't see others. You can't love others. You can't join the dance. You're stuck in a moment that's not a real moment. For it exists only in your head. People can get stuck for the entire ride, and even after the ride. Perhaps you did something 50 years ago, and now you're stuck in shame over that moment, and terrified of a future moment, the end of the ride. Uh, thus, you're not riding the ride, but just going round and round, stuck in nowhere and nothing, stuck in a moment, and you can't get yourself out of it. Exactly. You're stuck. In the screw tape Letters by C.S. Lewis, a senior devil gives advice to a junior devil on how to tempt humans. The humans live in time, writes Screwtape, but our enemy, God, destines them to eternity. He therefore, I believe, wants them to attend chiefly to two things, to eternity itself and to that point of time which they call the present, now, the present. For the present is the point at which time touches eternity. In it alone, freedom and actuality are offered them. Our business is to get them away from the eternal and from the present, writes Screwtape. You know, the present moment is the only moment in which we can experience real freedom. It's the only moment in which we can have a relationship with a real person and not an imaginary person in, in our head. It's the moment time touches eternity. It's the moment in which love happens. It's the moment in which we live the life that God has for us. We live by faith, writes Paul. So your life is like that line that we talked about last week, remember? Space and time, as we experience, is the story of God's creation in six days, and we're still living in the sixth day being created. In other words, space and time is like a roller coaster with a perfect ending. For on the seventh day, everything, absolutely everything, is good. Shalom. Our universe, beginning to end, is, is like this line. And God commanded the Jews to live every week in remembrance and anticipation of this line. And your life is like this line. Jesus said, I am the beginning and the end. You see, Jesus is the meaning of every moment. Jesus is the plot. The plot to the story, beginning to end. Jesus is the author and finisher of the story. Hebrews 12, 2, we read that Jesus is also the author and finisher of our faith. Literally, the beginner and ender of our faith. The opposite of faith is sin. And last week we said sin is trying to seize control of the right. So maybe this is sin. Maybe it's trying to turn the roller coaster into a merry-go-round. Your own little merry-go-round of control, shame, and fear. Your time empty of the way, the plot, the meaning, empty time. Well, that's what happens on the sixth day. And that's what happens to all of us. That's what happens in the evil day. Ephesians 5, verse 15. Remember we read this. Paul wrote, look well how you walk, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Now our text, Ephesians 6, verse 13. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day 
And having done all to stand firm, stand therefore having fastened on the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and his shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness, the equipment uh, given by the gospel of peace, in all having taken up. Circumstances is added by the translator who also changed the tense of the verb. So Paul actually writes, in all having taken up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil. And you see, think, I think Paul is saying that all the armor is faith. And a thoreos. Faith is a thoreos, which comes from the word thura, which means door. It's a shield that's also a door, and it was about the size of a door. It wasn't the small Roman shield, it was this large Roman shield with the thoreos. Um, Roman soldiers would form a phalanx. Maybe you've seen that in movies. It's like a, a moving fortress of shields with which they would advance on enemy territory. Actually, all this armor is for advancing and never for retreating. Roman armor did not cover your backside. So if someone was kicking your backside, it meant you needed to turn around and fight. With the Thoreoi, the Roman army would advance on enemy territory. The greatest threat to the army was the flaming arrow. So the, so the Romans would coat the Thoreoi in leather and then soak the shields in water before battle so that the flaming arrows would be extinguished on contact. Paul writes, in all having taken up the Thoreon of faith. And what is faith? You know, in the 20th century, maybe for the first time in history, the church started defining faith as your ability to be stupid. I mean, really, some actually argued that faith was the opposite of reason. But Jesus is the reason, the logos, the truth. We're to have faith in the reason. So faith is not your ability to be stupid. And faith is not your ability to be smart. Some have thought that faith is figuring it out, evidence that demands a verdict. So you get faith by taking knowledge. But in the Bible, people often take knowledge so that they don't need faith. We think if I know enough about God, well then I won't have to trust God. I can trust my knowledge of God and use that to manipulate God, to get things from, from God. So biblical faith is not your ability to be stupid, and it's not your ability to be smart. Actually, it's not your ability, and that's what makes it so incredibly difficult to talk about. It's yours. You have it, but the moment you're proud of it, it's not it, and you don't have it. Biblical faith is trust in another person's judgment. 16 years ago, we surprised our kids and drove to Disney World in Orlando, Florida. Incredible trip in our blue minivan. Three, four days, something like that. When we got there, we were so excited. Jonathan, Elizabeth, and I, like I told you last week, we spent the first few days riding the roller coaster in Space Mountain. And then we saw this sign for Alien Encounter. Alien Encounter wasn't really a, a physical ride. I've told some of you about it. it. It wasn't really a physical ride because you actually didn't go anywhere, but it is an emotional, it was an emotional roller coaster, believe me, on which you, you could get stuck. There were warning signs everywhere. And so John, who was nine at the time, he kept looking at me and going, Dad, am I gonna be okay? Elizabeth, who was eight, kept lecturing John on courage. Look, John, I'm not afraid. Look, John, I'm okay. Look, John, I have courage. In other words, look, John, I have faith. John wanted my judgment. Elizabeth trusted her own judgment. She had faith in her own faith, which isn't real faith, Probably a better word for it would be pride. Well, Alien Encounter was one of these animatronic rides, you know, where they lock you in your chair and they feed you a story. 
After some demonstrations of XS Industries' amazing new teleportation technology, we were ushered into a large room where we were all seated in harnesses surrounding this large glass and metal tube. Some strange looking people appeared on, this, on the television screens and welcomed us to this uh, main demonstration. One of them explained that he was the chairman of XS, Indus XS Industries and, and that currently he was on another planet on the other side of the galaxy. But now, through the amazing new XS teleportation technology, he himself would be beamed through space from this other galaxy into our room and materialize in front of us in the XS teleportation transportation tube. Pretty cool. And John and Elizabeth were doing just fine. When all at once one of the technicians started to act as if something was wrong, actually something very wrong, she yelled out, I, I must have recalibrated and then I've locked onto another planet in the transmission path. Oh, what is it? It's not him. It's an alien. It's carnivorous. Uh, the transportation tube, it's, what's, it's starting to break. By now, all the chairs are, are rocking. Through the smoke and flashing lights, you suddenly see this huge dragon-like creature materialize in the excess transportation module. I, I look at John, and he looks at me, I smile, and he's okay. He's okay. He knows Dad loves me, and this is still part of the ride, he's okay. He has faith in me. I look at Elizabeth and she's not looking at me. She's not okay. She's looking at the alien and all at once I realize, oh crap, she's bought the lie. She's bought the lie. The technician yells, people of earth do not worry as long as the force field beams are on, the alien can't fly out. Just then the power fails and the voice comes out, it's out. Get the alien back in the tube before it eats somebody and all at once you feel alien breath on the back of your neck and you hear the sound of an alien eating somebody right above your head and then and then like liquid blood drips on your on your head and on your hands and then Elizabeth started screaming. She started to scream, we have to get out of here. Now! I looked over and I had never seen such expressions of terror. Absolute terror. And I remember thinking she actually believes that she's about to be eaten by an alien. And my heart broke for her. I felt her fear but I was locked into my chair. And so I remember I just looked at her and I started screaming, Elizabeth, Elizabeth, look at me, look at me, Elizabeth, look at me, it's not real, it's not real, it's not real, it's a lie. But in that moment, I couldn't explain my judgment that it was a lie. I couldn't explain how the breath that she felt really came from air tubes in the back of the chair. I couldn't explain that the liquid dripping on her head was tap water and not blood. I couldn't explain that the gears and the levers in the room shook the chair and not alien footsteps. I couldn't explain that at that moment she was far safer than she had been for the last four days riding in the blue minivan. I couldn't explain it. <laughs> All I could do was try to get her to trust my judgment more than her own judgment. Screaming, listen to me, look at me, it's not real, it's not real, it's not real. Now the air was real. The liquid was real. The shaking was real. All of that was true, but it took the form of a lie. You see, Elizabeth had taken a flame and arrow right to the chest, and now everything had taken upon itself a false meaning. The air meant alien breath. The liquid meant blood. The shaking meant that sh we would all die. Uh, Elizabeth believed their little story and forgot the plot, the big plot. We were still on vacation. I still loved her. 
we would still have turkey legs and ice cream at lunch. Everything was going according to plan. I couldn't explain my judgment, but hoped that she'd trust my heart. And so I screamed, Elizabeth, listen to me, listen to me, look at me. But she couldn't. And she didn't. For she was trapped in her own little merry-go-round of fear. It started as a rather attractive lie that she told herself and told John. I'm in control. An attractive lie that turned into hell. And after the ride was over, it wasn't over for Elizabeth. She literally sat on my lap for a half hour on this bench outside the ride, sobbing and shaking, stuck in a moment, imprisoned by a lie. I think hell is a merry-go-round of pride, shame, and fear. Hades is the biblical word for it. It's inhabited with ghosts under the dominion of the devil. People stuck in space and time, hanging on to their own control. You see, maybe hell is not God's judgment, but a person stuck in their own judgment. And that begins here. I found a video of Alien Encounter on YouTube. You can go online and watch this if you want, but it's a bit discombobulating. For You hear people screaming and sobbing in absolute terror, while other people are laughing hysterically on the very same ride. I really felt bad for taking Elizabeth on that ride, but now she laughs about it. It's one of our very best memories. Last week I shared with you the poem that she wrote for me. Dads that are always there for you. Dads that will kiss you before bed. Dads that teach you how to be brave. Dads that will take you on the big rides. Dads, if they were not here, the world would be blank. Nothing. You see, on that ride, Elizabeth grew faith. Or faith grew in Elizabeth in me, her dad. Do you have faith in your dad? See, maybe that's why you're on this ride. He wants you to encounter the alien and not be trapped by the alien, but laugh at the alien's lies and trust him, your dad, our father in heaven. You know, if you were to ask Elizabeth today, I think she'd tell you, that was one hell of a ride. And then she'd laugh. On that ride, even after that ride, she grew faith, or faith grew in Elizabeth. I mean, she sat on my lap sobbing and shaking for an hour after the ride as I held her and kissed her and spoke my word to her and entered into her little merry-go-round of fear. And now Elizabeth's little merry-go-round of fear has been incorporated into our story of love. It's filled with new meaning, expressed as faith. Ephesians 4, Paul told us that the word of God, Jesus, descended into the depths of this earth. He descended into, the, descended into the depths of our empty time. He descended into hell and led a host of captives free. At the cross, eternity invaded temporality. Meaning invaded our chaos and our futility. At the cross, the word was spoken into our void, making your merry-go-round part of his gospel ride. Where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. And if you trust that, the plan for the fullness of your time, if you trust him, Emmanuel, God with you on this ride, well then you see you can laugh in the face of the evil one and none of his flaming darts will burn as you lift your hands and you shout, wow, what a ride, what a ride. So Paul writes, in all, having taken up the shield of faith with which you can quench all the flaming darts of the alien one or the evil one. So what are the flaming darts? 
Well, devil literally means accuser. And Jesus said he is the father of lies, and lies according to his nature, like he himself is, is a lie. And scripture records some of his lies, and they really are flaming arrows. Genesis 3, remember he appears as a snake and shoots arrows at the woman. It's a bit surprising to realize how much truth is on those arrows. I mean, their eyes were opened, right, like the devil said. And they were made like God, having the knowledge of good and evil. I mean, God even shows up at the end of the, of the chapter and says, you can read it, Genesis 3, look, they've become like us, knowing good and evil. Um, knowing good, and, and yet, they, they, did, they did die. The day you eat of it, you will die, says the Lord. That's the sixth day, the evil day. But the lie, you see, by the snake wasn't really even verbalized. The devil made an accusation which was true. You're not like God. Then the devil made a suggestion, a solution. So why don't you seize control, take knowledge, and make yourself like God? And it was all based on an implied lie, and this is the lie. God is not trustworthy. That's the lie. Next in biblical history, the devil tempts Job. And God lets the devil tempt Job because God is looking for a champion, one who will trust God, though it seems that he's been forsaken. Job's world falls apart, and then the arrows come through his religious friends. Accusation, Job, you failed. Suggestion, this is how you seize control and gain control of God. Do this, do that, do this, do that. And then we read how Satan tempts David. And check this out, it's not sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Uh, Satan tempted David, not with Led Zeppelin and Harry Potter. Or, uh, Satan tempted David this way. First Chronicles 21, one, you should read this. Do, do any of you remember how Satan tempted David? This is what it says. Satan incited David to number Israel. He tempted him to take a census. Accusation, David, maybe your army isn't big enough. Well, and that matters because maybe your God isn't big enough. Suggestion, you better get worried and seize control. The Lord is so displeased that the angel of Yahweh stands over Mount Zion with a sword ready to destroy Jerusalem until David offers to die in her place. And it was on that spot that the temple was built. And it was on that mountain that the son of David died for you, where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. Next, in Zechariah 3, the next place we read about Satan, the prophet sees Satan standing in the temple accusing the high priest whose name is Joshua, pronounced Jesus in English. Next, we read uh, about Satan uh, in, in the book of Matthew, when Jesus is led by the Holy Spirit out into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And check out the flaming darts, Matthew 4. The devil tempts Jesus to turn stones into bread. But that's a good thing. Isn't that good? The, the devil tempts Jesus to seize control of the good. And then the devil tempts Jesus with scripture. Did you know that the devil quotes scripture? I mean, maybe sometimes he quotes it to you. The devil knows scripture, but he hates the plot. He hates the meaning, and the meaning is Jesus. The word means God is salvation. The devil quotes scripture, and aren't scriptures true? Well, they are accurate. Maybe that's what an accusation is. Truth, used for evil. Maybe that's what a lie is. Stolen truth used for evil. Jesus said, I am the truth. And so to lie is to like kill him and cut him up and use him for evil. 
Well, anyway, Satan tempts Jesus with knowledge of truth, but Satan hates the truth. He tempts Jesus to seize control rather than surrender control to his father. Next, Satan speaks through Peter. Right after Jesus commissions Peter and says he's the rock on which he'll build his church, Peter says, but Jesus, you can't suffer. You can't die. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. Is that crazy? So you see, the flaming arrows can come through talking snakes, calamities, religious friends, even your best friend, like Peter. They can come in the form of scripture or just thoughts that enter your head. They will contain truths, and yet they won't be true. Like bits of fire stolen from the altar. At the root, they're all the same. A, a bit of truth, like you sinned, and then the lie. So now you better seize control. Because God can't be trusted. God can't be trusted. That's the lie. So you better seize control. You better trust your own judgment. God can't be trusted. That's the judgment. Trust your, your own judgment. You know, the Old Testament reveals that every child of Adam seized control of the ride and trapped themselves in a prison of pride, shame, and fear until the last Adam, God's champion, son of David, our high priest, remained faithful unto death. Faithful unto death such that even though he bore the sin of the world, even though he had descended into our hell, even though he did not know why he felt forsaken, he cried out to God and surrendered his spirit. He is the first Adam to be faithful unto death. And Paul says that he is the firstborn from the dead. Firstborn of all creation. Book of Hebrews tells us that he became flesh, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong bondage. And you know, that's what Elizabeth feared on the alien encounter ride. Death. Death is the ultimate loss of control. And we're dying every day. Fear of death is why we try to seize control of the ride. Because we think death is the end. We think death is the final judgment. Some even think that endless death is God's final judgment upon those who have not maintained control on the ride. Colossians 2, Paul tells us that in Christ, death and resurrection, God disarmed the forces of evil, for we were buried with him, buried with him in baptism. And we were raised with him through faith. Galatians 2.20, Paul writes this. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. It's like faith in Paul was the life of Christ in Paul or, or maybe the life of Christ covering Paul. Well, imagine the flaming arrows that were shot at Paul. Accusation, Paul, you persecuted the body of Christ in the name of God. My goodness. You're the chief of sinners. Is that true? It's in the Bible. Paul wrote it. Suggestion, you ought to judge yourself, curse yourself. Paul, shut up and die. And yet those flaming arrows were quenched. For Paul saw something, he saw someone. He saw that Jesus had already been cursed and Jesus had already died on his behalf, and that God, his Father, was in Jesus, reconciling Paul and the cosmos to himself. He saw that God is love, and God is a consuming fire, and you see, flaming darts just aren't a big threat to consuming fire. He saw that Jesus Christ, crucified and risen from the dead, is God's judgment. 
Jesus said, now is the judgment of this world. We can't fully explain God's judgment, but we can see God's judgment. God is love, and greater love has no man than this, that he lay his life down for his friends. In Jesus, your father laid his life down for you. In Jesus, your father takes all your flaming arrows and delivers your old body of sin to destruction in the flames of his own love outside the city in the valley of Gehenna. And in Jesus, your father gives you his own righteousness. In Jesus, you pass through God's judgment of fire, and now Jesus is your shield against flaming darts. You see, the flames can't burn where they've already burned. Jesus is the armor of God that will not burn. Flaming darts can't hurt the one who dwells in eternal fire, the angel of Yahweh who dwells in the flame. It was Jesus walking around with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. And so what are the flaming darts of the evil one? Well, I think they must be Stolen fire, stolen truth, used for evil. The flaming darts are Satan's judgments that become your judgments, but Jesus Christ crucified and risen from the dead is God's judgment incarnate in a resurrected, indestructible, eternal body that includes your body, Ephesians 2, Paul said it, he reconciles us both in one body through the cross, and then verse 10, the plan for the fullness of time to anacephalia, to unite under one wounded head all things. That's God's judgment. So you won't be burned by Satan's judgments if you trust God's judgment. And he's sitting right next to you on the ride. And so he looked at John and smiled. He looked at me and enjoyed the ride. I looked at Elizabeth and began to yell. Look at me, look at me, look at me. In the moment, I couldn't explain my judgment, but I... But if she saw my face, I, I hoped that she would, because if she did, if she saw my face, she would trust my judgment. Faith is not your ability to be stupid. Faith is not your ability to be smart. Faith is not your ability. Faith is trust in another's judgment. And you can't be proud of it because then it's not their judgment, but your judgment. Trust is the product of someone proving themselves trustworthy. Faith is the product of someone being faithful to you. History is the story of God's faithfulness and the creation of your faith. The ride creates faith, and faith is how you travel. So when the flaming darts start coming your way, look at your father. Look at your father. And that should raise an obvious question, well, where's my father? On the sixth day, Friday, after communion, Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Henceforth, from this time forth, you've seen him. And you know him. Jesus is the presence of your Father. And the judgment of your Father. That's why you should read your Bible. That's why you should go to church. That's why you should focus on Jesus. Jesus is the presence of your father and the judgment of your father. In the moment of his crucifixion, he jumped on all our merry-go-rounds for he bore all our sin, making all our merry-go-rounds part of his ride, proving himself faithful in every possible way. And now, in space and time, he's showing you. So when the flaming darts start coming your way, look to Jesus, crucified and risen from the dead. People may quote scripture that fill you with all sorts of fear. They may quote scripture, but you know the plot. People may say all sorts of things about him, but you know him. Look at him, how he loves you, and he's risen. See, God is in control of this ride, and he's entrusted all judgment to the Son. People may 
teach you to run from God's judgment, but look at him. He is God's judgment, and it is finished. For too long, the institutional church has acted like faith comes from fearing God's judgment. When scripture says faith comes from hearing God's judgment, God's word, God's judgment creates faith, for God's judgment reveals that God is faithful. For too long we've been speaking Satan's lies and creating theological merry-go-rounds of fear. We say stuff like this, you're saved if you decide to be saved. And what are you saved from? You're saved from your bad decisions, so decide. Or you might be saved if God has decided to save you from your bad decisions. And you'll know if he has decided to save you, if you will decide that he has decided. Uh, no! God's judgment is eternal. God's decision is eternal. God's decision is Jesus. God's judgment is salvation. And my judgment is damnation. Good news! God's judgment is to save me from my own judgment. Good news, God is in control of this ride. And when I see that and I hear that, I have faith, I let go, I lose my life and I, and I find it. I live each moment of my life and it must look something, kind of something like this. <laughs> back here, little one. He's ruining the play! He's ruining the whole play! I think that's a popcorn kid. That's cute. But my life includes far more trauma than a ruined children's play. In fact, my life is ruined and it ends in death. Well, remember, your life is to be an experience of Christ's life. Your life is to be a communion with him in his death and resurrection. And that, my friends, is one hell of a ride. Ten years ago, I watched my father die. <laughs> the last thing I did for him was I gave him communion, and I remember I said, Dad, this cup, this cup is the covenant in his blood. Drink it. And I held it up to his lips, and he drank it. And the last thing I heard my father say to me in this world was, Thank you. Since then, for me, it's been one hell of a ride that strangely resembles my father's ride and Jesus' ride with a lot of flame and arrows. And too often, let me tell you, they stick. Just before I was publicly tried and defrocked by my denomination, one Sunday at church six years ago, having just given communion, my wife grabbed me and she said, Peter, I saw dad. Now, I, I told you about, I've told you about that, but I'm still processing that, trying to figure out what it means. I saw dad. He had been dead for 
four years, or maybe alive for four years. She said, Peter, I saw your dad, and he was standing right in front of us, and Peter, he was so alive. I mean, it was like his eyes were on fire, and he was just so excited. You see, his very countenance expressed this, this thought. What a ride, what a ride. She said, Peter, I saw your dad, and then he held out his hands, and in his hands there was a bowl, and he said this, he said, Susan and Peter, do not be afraid to drink the cup that the Lord has for you. And then he vanished. For six years I've been pondering, what does that mean? I think it means, Peter, do not be afraid to live your life. Have faith and enjoy the ride. What a ride. What a ride. And so, on the sixth day, that night, the beginning of the sixth day, he took bread and he broke it, saying, this is my body given to you. Take and eat and do it in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper and having given thanks, he took the cup and he said, this cup is the covenant, the eternal covenant in my blood poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it, all of you, and do it in remembrance of me. And by the way, death is not the end of the ride. Don't let that be a flaming arrow. I don't think they died. But death is not the end of the ride. Why does the church keep threatening people with endless death? 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 26, Paul writes, the last enemy to be destroyed is death. And then comes the end. And who's the end? Jesus. And he's the life. Jesus is the end. He's the life. And this table is an altar of eternal fire. And so we invite you to come to the table, tear off a piece of the bread, dip it in the cup. Dark cups are wine. Light cups are juice. Uh, come to the table. Come to an altar of eternal fire and remember you have been judged, and you are eternally forgiven. Believe the gospel. In Jesus' name, amen. And you make all things work together for my good. You make all things work together for my good now you may be thinking if that's true and I was judged at the cross and judged from the foundation of the world if God has already made up his mind about me I mean if you hear what Paul is preaching to us you might be tempted to say this well then gosh why not sin that grace may abound. And Paul would say to you, Ah! You don't get it! You see, to sin is to trap yourself on the ride. At the root of all sin is a refusal to look at your Father who loves you because you don't see Him, because you're trapped in your own fears. And so you may be saying, so then what do I do if I'm trapped in my sin and my fears and my shame? Look at your father! And where's your father? If you've seen me, said Jesus, you've seen the father. So right now, some of you have flaming arrows sticking in your side, your back, and they burn. And, and the arrows say, oh, this can't be true, this can't be true, this can't be true. Don't, don't believe it, don't believe it, don't be, You suck, I hate you. <laughs> well, let's look at our Father. Close your eyes, just close your eyes. And, and, and ask the Lord, Lord, 
What are the flaming arrows that, that I've believed that stick in my flesh? You know, a lot of times it's hard for me to figure out what they are. But if I just look at him, they drop away. And, and so you're standing there. Maybe you know what the arrows are. Maybe, maybe you're not sure, but, but you're standing there. Now, now just, I want you to, to, to picture this, to imagine this. Jesus is in front of you. Lift your eyes and look at him. Now, there are wounds in his feet, wounds in his hands, wounds on his side. But he's not angry. He set everything up so he could do this for you. Do you see how much he loves you? Oh, the Father made up his mind about you long before you ever began riding the ride. I mean, how silly to think that something on the ride could change his mind who exists beyond space. Look at him. Do you know what he is? He is consuming fire, manifest before you. Walk into the fire. Just walk into the fire. Don't fear the consuming fire. And you see, once you learn to not fear the consuming fire, once you trust the Father's judgment, well, who gives a rip about Satan's judgments? In Jesus' name, you are forgiven from the foundation of the world. Now, be forgiven in your own mind, your own heart. Your Father loves you, and He controls the right. In Jesus' name, believe the eternal gospel. In the Revelation, it says it's an eternal gospel. Believe it. Amen. Hey there. I hope the message that you just heard or viewed helped you to believe a little more that God is better than you thought, the love of Jesus is deeper than you know, and the Spirit is everywhere working the wonders of mercy. If that's so, I'd love it if you would consider two things. Number one, ask yourself if there's someone that you know that might benefit from this message and then uh, forward this link on to them. There are several ways that you can do that by visiting our website at thesanctuarydowntown.org. Secondly, I'd love it if you'd uh, take just a moment and uh, ask the Lord if He'd like you to contribute to this endeavor financially. We really can't do this except for the fact that God inspires people like you um, to give. And uh, you can do that by uh, going to the website and clicking on uh, the donate button or uh, by simply mailing a check to the sanctuary downtown at uh, 2215 West 30th Avenue, Denver, Colorado 80211. Uh, thanks for being a part of what we're doing, and God bless you.